Hey everyone, thanks for joining Learn to Play Games. My name is Lance, and in today's video, I'm going to teach you how to play Wolfenstein the board game. This is a new game by Archon Studio that just got done shipping to Kickstarter backers. It is a one to four player game that takes roughly 45 minutes to an hour and a half to play, and is a fully cooperative game where all the players are working together to complete whichever scenario they've chosen to go on. So this game itself is based on the Wolfenstein video game, and I don't know a lot about the backstory, but the basic gist is that the players are going to take on the roles of the heroes in the World War II era where they're trying to defeat the Nazis and ultimately bring down Hitler himself. So as the as if you play through the campaign, that is your overall objective, and as you complete each one of the missions, you'll be slowly working your way towards trying to defeat the big guy himself. So in this video, I'm going to teach you how to play, starting with the components, set up the phases in each one of the rounds, and the end game conditions. As always, if you find these videos helpful, if you like what I do, please consider that like button and subscribe to my channel. It's one of the easiest ways you can support channels like mine so we can continue to grow and be able to produce this content. If you want to get notifications when I drop new videos, also consider ringing that notification bell, and that will alert you anytime I drop some new videos. So let's go ahead and head to the table, and I'll teach you how to play. First, let's start by looking at the breakdown of the dice that are included in the game. These are a custom set of 12-sided dice, and five of the sides are going to have the armor hit, one side is going to have an HP hit, one side will have a reload, and five sides will have a blank. From there, let's move over to the different decks of cards you're going to be using throughout the game. The first are the chess cards, and when you do a search action, you'll draw one of these, and it's going to list the name of that chess at the top, along with its image, and then the effects that you'll resolve when drawing it. And most of these will have you gaining either a weapon, a new token or ammo token, or other equipment. The equipment deck is going to contain a ton of different types of equipment in it. Each one of these cards will list the name of the card on the top, along with the action points that you'll have to spend in order to use it, and then it will have a description and how the different effects on the card will be resolved. As well, up in the top corner is going to be the type of card it is, and there's going to be a whole collection of different types of cards, including suits, consumable cards, other cards, attachable cards, armor cards, and booster cards. The next deck of cards I'm going to look at are the event cards. When you perform a search action on an event token, you're going to draw and resolve one of these cards. Each of these cards will list the name of the card on the top, and then we'll have usually a couple of different options for the players to choose. Some of these options will also grant a reward for the player itself, and others will also have some team rewards. So for example, at this second one here, when, we, when a player completes this, that player is going to receive the rewards listed underneath there, and then the entire team will receive the rewards in the gray section. Moving over to the weapon cards, each one of these cards is going to list the name of that weapon on the top, along with its image, and then each weapon is going to have three stats, which includes the, the maximum range that weapon has, the number of dice you're going to roll when attacking with that weapon, and the cost in action points you must spend to activate that weapon. Each weapon is going to list the type of ammo you must have in order to use that weapon. There's three different types. You'll have light, heavy, and special. Each weapon is also going to have a number of special abilities you can activate by spending the number of ammo listed on that weapon of that type. So in order to use a quick reload, I must discard one of the light ammo, in order to use the Magnum, I must discard two. And each one of these weapons is going to work a little bit differently, requiring different things. Now, some weapons' abilities are going to have the Infinity Symbol, which means that they are always active and will always take place when you're using that weapon. So make sure you pay attention to what those are, as they will give you little bonuses. Each enemy in the game will also have a card corresponding to that enemy, which is going to list the name of that enemy on the top, along with its number, which you'll find on its base as well. Each enemy is also going to have four stats going down the side of the card, which are the number of hit points it has, the number of armor points it has, its action points, and initiative. Each enemy is going to have a weapon that will list the name of the weapon there, along with its stats, again, the range of that weapon, the number of dice that, that weapon rolls when attacking, and the cost and action points you must that enemies will spend to use that weapon. Enemies are also going to have a number of skills, which will be listed underneath the enemy. And then finally, each enemy is going to have a number of rewards when you defeat it. The rewards in red are going to be for the player that defeated that enemy. And any rewards listed in gray are going to be team rewards, so all players will receive these. All right, so we're ready to move into setup. So at the beginning of setup, the first thing you want to do is select the difficulty you want to play. As you can see here on this guide, there's a number of choices 
couple that are a little easier and one that is harder. For this video, I'm going to be using the default Bring Them On, and this is the normal setting for this game. From there, you're going to choose a scenario you want to play. And for this particular video, I'm going to be using the very first scenario. So you'll lay out the board as it is instructed and then place out all the different miniatures and tokens. Now, an important note with the miniatures, each one of them will have a number on their base that is going to correspond to the number on their card and will be outlined in the scenario. So make sure you're putting the right miniatures in the right spots for that. From there, you're going to move into player setup. So with player setup, you're going to always use four heroes. You can randomly choose them or each player can choose them however you want. And if there are fewer than four players playing, then multiple players or some of the players will control multiple heroes. So from there, let's go ahead and cover player setup. Before getting into hero setup, let's take a look at a breakdown of the hero's dashboard. So each hero has their own dashboard, which is going to list the name of that hero on the top along with their image, and then their different stats, which includes the number of hit points and armor points that hero has, their number of action points that they have, and accuracy points. Each hero is also going to have a list of different items and starting things that that hero will get during setup, which I'll cover in a minute. And then heroes are also going to have a number of skills. Throughout the game, heroes are going to gain glory tokens that they can spend to activate those skills. And any skill that has the infinity symbol on it will always be active or will have other conditions such as this one that is a once per mission. So once you use it, you won't be able to use it again, but it is going, it does not have a cost with it. Each hero is also going to have a quick reference of all the different actions that hero can perform and the amount of action points you must spend to carry those out. At the bottom of each hero's card is going to be slots for their different items that they can equip, such as armor and suits, boosters, and other. And then the other side is going to be the hero's weapons that they're going to have. For hero setup, each player will select a hero they want to play as and will gain their dashboard and their miniature. And then, as I said before, each hero is going to list the items that they're going to gain at, during setup. So our hero here is going to have a special armor a hatchet that you can place off to the side, and the laser craft war, which is their his weapon that he's going to start with. Each hero is also going to start with a shared life token. The next step is to place out all the cards you're using for this mission. For the enemy cards, you can either leave them in a stack and draw the enemies as you need them, which I like to do, or you can place those out next to the different areas where the enemies are, or however you want to do it. I keep my stack in sequential numbers, that way then I can easily pull those out as I need them. And I'll place that stack here. Now you'll also have a reserve stack of enemies that might be spawned depending upon the particular scenario you're playing. For these, I'll place these off to the side. Again, these will come out if the hazard tracker reaches a certain number as I'll cover a little bit later. You're also going to have the weapon cards and event cards. Go ahead and shuffle up both of those decks and place them out. So I'm gonna place my weapon cards over here and I'll have my event cards up here. Then also go ahead and shuffle up the chest cards and place those out somewhere. So I'm gonna go ahead and drop those there. And then with the equipment cards, shuffle those up as well. And then each player will draw one from there. So let's see what we got here. So we have the gold face mask, a gold bust, the stat car or star card, and finally we have sound grenade. And then the rest of these can be placed out. So I'm gonna go ahead and place those out over there. Also go ahead and place out the round tracker if this particular scenario uses it and set that to one. And also place out your hazard tracker set at zero. The last step is to choose a starting player and you can do this in any manner you want to. You can roll a dice or simply talk amongst the group and decide which player would be the best to go. An important note with this is that players will normally start off of the scenario board and during that player's turn they'll place their miniature on the spawn point as you're going to see. Wolfenstein the board game is either played over a set number of rounds where you'll have a certain number of rounds to complete the objectives and in the end of the final round if you have not completed those objectives and you have lost the game or an unset number of rounds in which case then you simply have to meet the objectives before the fail conditions come into play and again this is going to be based on the scenario. So each one of the rounds is going to consist of three phases, the player phase, enemy phase, and cleanup phase. I'm going to take you through each one of these in more detail to show you how they work. Each round starts with the player phase, and during this phase, the first player will take their turn, and then it'll proceed in a clockwise manner around the board, where each player will get to take a turn with their hero. 
During each player's turn, that player is going to spend their action points to carry out a variety of different actions, and I'm going to take you through each one of these in more detail to show you how they work. Now, a player can perform any of the actions any number of times as long as they, actually, they have action points to spend to do so. The one exception to that is the attack action, which normally can only be done once per player turn. Now, again, there is one exception to that as well, which is the fatigue token, and I'm going to cover that more a little bit later in the video as well. So let's go ahead and move into it and see what kind of actions our heroes can take. Each player's turn consists of a number of steps that are done in order. At the beginning of a player's turn, they're going to generate a number of action points that is listed on their tile. Now, the one exception to this is if the player starts their turn with a fatigue token. In that situation, the player is going to generate half of their normal number of action points. So with Blaskowitz here, if he had a fatigue token, he would generate three action points that he'll spend during his turn instead of his normal six. From there, then, you're going to spend your action points, and I'm going to go through each one of the different actions you can take, and there's a quick reference on the player board, as you can see here, to some of the actions you can take and their costs for that. Once you've spent all of your action points or choose not to spend any more, then the next step is if you had a fatigue token from the previous turn, you get to remove this at that point. And then finally, if you are in a room with another model, whether it is a friendly model or an enemy model, you are also going to generate noise. And I'll cover that a little bit later in the video. The first action I'll look at is a move action. Each action point you spend to move allows you to move from your space to an adjacent space, which are one of the eight spaces surrounding your hero, both orthogonally and diagonally. Now, you cannot move off of a tile onto the game board as each tile is considered to have walls on all sides that are not connected by passages or other tiles. You also are not allowed to move onto a space that contains a storage chest, a mission objective token, or an event token. You can move through spaces but cannot end on spaces that have your spawn points, enemy spawn points, or secret passages. So I could move through this space but I could not end on it. You are also allowed to move through spaces that have friendly hero models. You cannot move through spaces that have enemy models. The other important thing with this is difficult terrain. So when moving onto a space that is considered difficult terrain, it costs you one additional action point per space. So for example, with my hero here, I would have to spend two action points to move onto that space and an additional two action points to move onto this space. It only costs one action point to move off of a space that's difficult train back onto regular train. So for example, this one, it would only cost me one action point. Now, there are a couple things that are going to block your way as well. You cannot move through barricades unless the barricade has been taken down, which I'll explain how to do that later, or closed doors, which you'll have to open first. Again, I will cover that a little bit later. Your hero will be able to spend an action point to open a door that is closed, but once a door is opened, you can never close it again. Doors do block line of sight to enemy models, so currently our hero cannot see this enemy back here. But if he spends an action point, he'll be able to open this doorway up, and then he can see this enemy. In the second example here, with the barricades, you are able to see through to an enemy, so you can attack an enemy through a barricade that is closed. And you cannot open a barricade unless you have a weapon that has the pierce through metal. So as you can see here on this MG60, it has an ability that is called pierce through metal, which allows a hero to remove a barricade, which is going to cost the hero one action point. The search action is going to cost your hero one action point and will allow them to pick up a chest token, objective token, or an event token that they are adjacent to. The one exception to this is if there are enemies in your room, you are not allowed to perform a search action. From there, let's like a, take a closer look at each one of these different tokens. With the objective token, you'll simply remove it from the board and add it to your hero's dashboard. The second one is the chest token. When you do a search action on a chest token, you'll remove that token and draw the top card of the chest deck. As you can see here, the metal shelf allows us to draw one card from the weapon deck, and then we'll discard the metal shelf. The final token is the event token. When this is taken, you'll remove the token as usual and draw the top card of the event deck. So as you can see here with this event, this is Claus's former companion. So you encounter a patrol before anyone gets a chance to lift a gun. One of these soldiers runs towards you shouting that he has decided to defect and has information for you. This is, is this an opportunity or a bluff? You're going to roll a die. So anytime an event or other effect in the game forces you or has you to roll a die, this is going to be a success-fail situation. 
If you can roll a shield or a hit icon, then it is considered a success. If you roll a blank or a reload, then it is a fail situation. So as you can see on the card, it'll have an success effect or a fail effect, depending upon your roll. The next action I'll look at is an attack action, but before covering that, I need to talk about line of sight and range. So first off, let's cover line of sight. In order to determine if you have line of sight, you must draw two straight lines from two different corners of your space to two different corners of your enemy space. As long as those lines do not cross an enemy or friendly model, a closed door, or outside of the tile, you have line of sight to it. For example, if our model was up here and we tried to draw a straight line, it would cross between these two tiles, and so we, it would be blocked by the walls, and we would not have line of sight. So in our example here, let's go ahead and determine if we have line of sight to this enemy in the back. So we're going to draw our first straight line from this corner over to our enemy here. And then the second line, we can go from this back corner over to this corner here. And so both of those lines do not cross anything, so we have line of sight to our enemy. The next thing that we need to determine is if we have range to our enemy. For this example, I'm going to look at the Strumgewehr. And as you can see on its card, it has a range of six spaces. So we're simply going to count spaces from our model to our enemy's model. And as long as we have a number of spaces equal to or less than our weapon's range, we have range for that. So from our hero, we're going to go one, two, three, four, five, and we have range to our target. All right, so now that I've covered line of sight and range, we're ready to move into an attack action. This is also the one exception to the rule, as you are only allowed to perform one attack action during your turn, unless you take a fatigue token, which will allow you to do one additional attack action, as long as you have the action points to spend to do so. So from there, let's move into the action itself. So with Blaskowitz here, he has a couple of enemies that he could potentially target, depending upon his weapon, and he has the Laser Quaffair equipped right now, which has a range of two spaces, so he could target either one of these drones. The other important thing to note with this is if your weapon has the reload token on it, you have to reload it first before you can attack, and it is going to cost you two actions to remove a reload token, and when doing so, you cannot use that weapon during this turn unless you take a fatigue token. So in order, if I had a reload token on here, I would have to remove this first, and then I'd have to take a fatigue token if I wanted to shoot that during this turn, as reloading takes a lot of effort, so you cannot reload at the same turn that you want to fire unless you take fatigue. But for my example, let's go ahead and say that I did not have a lead reload token. So with this weapon, first off, I'm going to gather up the dice that I need. The weapon itself grants me three dice. And then I, for characters, I'm also going to check their stats. And on the accuracy stat, as you can see here, this also grants him two additional dice. So he's going to be rolling five. And then if he had an ability on the weapon that he wanted to activate, he could potentially gain additional dice for that as well. Each of these abilities requires a certain number of ammo tokens that you must spend in order to activate it. And normally you can only activate one ability on a weapon per turn, so you can only do that one time. Now certain abilities that have the infinity symbol are always active, so you always can use those and will not account against your one ability per turn. Now, you do need at least one ammo to fire a weapon, but you're not going to discard that ammo when firing it unless you're using an ability that costs a certain number of tokens. So with the Laser Quaffair, it does have a, the special ammo requirement. So I do have one special ammo, so I can use it to attack. And I'm not going to, I don't have enough tokens, obviously, to trigger either of its abilities. So I'm simply going to do that. From here, I'm going to roll these dice and see how I do. All right, so from there, then I'm going to compare these results. And if I had any abilities that granted me any rerolls, I could choose to reroll some of those dice with that. Now, the important note with that is that you are never allowed to reroll a die more than once. So if you reroll and you get a worse result, you have to stay with that. So from here, let's go ahead and pull the enemy's card. And so I need drone 37 as I'm targeting this guy here. And the, each drone has a health of one hit point, as you can see, and two armor points. 
So first off, if you get any of the HP hits, those are going to go straight to the hit points and bypass the enemy's armor. So in this situation, I did one damage to his health and he only has one hit point, so I would have defeated him with that. But let's go ahead and say, for example, that I did not roll that heart, in which case then each one of the shields is going to take one point of armor away from the enemy any remaining shields after that will go towards that enemy's HP. So with this one, the enemy, as you can see, has two uh, shields and he has one HP, so the two shields will eliminate his armor and then the other shield is going to take care of his health. So either way, I would have defeated him in this situation. So once you, if you have not defeated an enemy, you're going to place a number of hit points or armor points on that enemy so you can keep track of it or you can place it on their card, whichever way you want to keep track of that. Otherwise, if you have defeated them, you'll go ahead and remove that model from the board. You're also going to check on the bottom of the card. It's going to list any rewards. The rewards in red are granted to the player that did that. So with this one, I'm going to gain one glory point. So I'll place a glory point on my hero. And then I also get one ammo token. So I'm going to go ahead and take another special ammo so I can start building up on that. If there are any gray rewards listed, then those are going to be for all other teammates. The character that defeated the enemy will not gain those rewards as he already received his rewards, but all the other players would receive any gray rewards that are going to be listed on the right bottom corner of the card. Now the other important thing I want to point out with these is the one other result that you're going to find on here is the reload symbol. If you roll one or more of those, you are going to have to place a reload token on your weapon, and then you'll have to spend. Now, when you place a reload token, the important note with it is that you cannot spend any additional action points you have this turn to remove it the same turn you received it. You'll have to wait until your following turn to re remove the reload token. From there, then, once you, anytime you defeat an enemy, unless it's a silent execution or if your weapon is equipped with a silencer, you also have to increase the hazard tracker. This is one of those ways that the hazard tracker will go up. And each mission is going to list the maximum threshold for the hazard tracker. If you reach that, then you're going to trigger an alarm. And I'm going to get into a little bit more about that later in the video. And I'll also be covering the silent attacks and our executions right after this. So at this point, then the enemy card can be removed from the board as you won't be needing that anymore. And that will conclude that attack action. So now that we've covered a regular attack, let's go ahead and see how a silent execution works or the silencer. So most of these are going to be found in your equip cards deck. So with this, you have to be adjacent to an enemy normally and the card itself will tell you how to do that. So let's go ahead and say that Blaskowitz went ahead and spent a move action to move back now that he's adjacent to the drone here. And that is drone number 38. And he happens to have a hatchet. So this, this particular one, as you can see, says that this hero can perform a silent execution attack action with six attack dice. And then I'm going to discard this card after use. So this card requires us, as you can see in the top left corner, to spend two action points to carry out. And then you would carry out the attack action just like normal. So this particular one allows you to gain six attack dice. So we'll go ahead and grab those. You don't get any bonus dice from your accuracy with this. And then you will go ahead and roll these. So let's go ahead and see what happens here. So again, we did very well with four shields. So again, with that enemy, first it would take, requires two shields to get through its armor. And then it has one health and each of the shields will remove one health after that. So this enemy has been defeated. And since we defeated it, but because it was with a silent execution weapon, we will not increase the hazard tracker for this. So this is going to be a very important part of the game. Being able to eliminate enemies without increasing that hazard tracker is a beautiful thing. So anytime you have an opportunity to gain something like this, definitely take advantage of that. So with the hatchet then, it'll be discarded to the discard pile now that we've used it. And then you would gain the rewards for that enemy as normal. So again, with that enemy, I would again gain another glory point and I would pick up another weapon or another ammo of my choice. And the last thing I want to point out with combat is if you ever have a situation due to an event card or equipment card or an ability or anything else that allows you to do damage without rolling dice, you are simply going to apply that damage first to the enemy's armor. And then if their armor is all depleted at that point, then you can go straight to their hit points, but it'll always resolve it against their armor first. 
So now that I've covered the two different type of attack actions, before moving on to the rest of the actions, I do want to cover noise and sound and how that works. As the first example of an attack action that I used, my weapon did not is not silenced, so it is going to generate noise. So in that situation, during the attack action, you're also going to drop a noise token into that room. And this is also going to apply if you attack from a room that you were in to a separate room or corridor. So for example, if Blaskowitz here target this drone back in this corridor, he would generate noise in the room that he's firing from or and into the room that he's firing into. So I would drop a noise token into that corridor as well. And this is going to be important during the Nazi phase. Now, the another important thing with noise is that if you use the silent execution, such as a hatchet or a knife, or if you have a silenced weapon, you're also not going to be placing noise into the room from the weapon's action itself. So in that second example with the hatchet, I would not have generated noise as that is a quiet attack. The other important thing is if you are in a room or corridor with multiple models, so whether it is an enemy or friendly model, that is also going to generate noise. So that is also going to be an important part of the game is planning out where everybody's going to kind of move so that you're not generating a bunch of noise and causing the enemies to come and investigate. So for example, with Blaskowitz here, if when he moved into this room, this room would have cons been considered or would have generated noise and he would have placed a noise token in there as part of that as he is in a room with multiple models. The next couple of actions I'm going to go over, most of these are going to be free actions and will not require you to spend action points to do them. The first one is an exchange action. If you are adjacent to another hero, you can exchange things with them, giving them ammo tokens, weapon cards, and even some equipment cards. You are not allowed to give them suits or boosters that you've already equipped to your character. You are also not allowed to give them glory points. An important note with this is that in this exchange, you are allowed to give them this stuff, but you cannot take anything. So you will not be able to gain any cards. They must give you those, their cards during their turn. Another important thing with this is if you decide to give them a, a weapon card that has a reload token on it, that reload token will go with the weapon that you're giving them. Another action you can choose to do during your turn is to exchange equipment or uh, weapon cards you have equipped. So your active weapon will always be on the right side of your card, but you can choose to switch that out with another weapon that you have that is, a, that is in your backpack. So for example, with our weapon here, let's go ahead and say that this weapon had a reload token on it, and we really desperately need to make another attack action, but obviously we cannot do that with the reload token on it this turn, as we just got this one, and so we won't be able to do that. So we're going to go ahead and switch this out and equip our other weapon so that we can make another attack action. Again, as long as we can take a fatigue token and we have the ammo that it requires. Another thing that you can do during your turn is once per turn, you can choose to spend your glory points to activate one of your skills on your character's card. Again, the, you can only choose one skill and you must have the number of glory points that you can, you can spend to activate that skill. Certain skills will also have the infinity symbol, which again means that they are always active and will, you'll be able to benefit, it, ben, benefit from it depending upon what the action is. The other thing is that you can use some equipment cards, such as the fruit here, does require you to spend zero action points. Other cards, such as this sound grenade, would require you to spend some action points. So it'll be dependent on the equipment card that you have and what it does, and then most of these will be discarded after use. So now that I've covered all the different actions that a hero can take, before moving on to the enemy phase, there's a couple of important things I want to go over. The first is the hazard tracker, as this is going to be a very important part of the game, and you managing this can be the difference between winning and losing the scenario. So there's going to be a number of different things that are going to increase the hazard tracker during the game. The first, as you saw already, is anytime you perform an attack action and eliminate an enemy, if you do not use a silencer or a silent execution, then it is going to raise that hazard tracker by one point. There's a couple other things that are going to cause this. Certain event cards will cause this and other effects such as even some enemies, such as the Soja. That particular enemy has an ability, which is the alarm process. So as you can see here on their card, at the beginning of the Nazi activation phase, move the hazard tracker forward by one point if at least one hero is in this model's line of sight. So that can raise that alarm really quickly. And of course, there'll be other things. Certain missions might have specific things or special things that'll raise that track. 
And then each scenario is going to provide a certain number that if that track hits it, that is going to raise the alarm, which will normally cause you to spawn additional models into the, their spawning zones. And if this happens during the enemy phase, you're also going to have to activate and resolve each of those models during that phase as well. So you're not going to get out of it if that is triggered during that phase. So now let me put this all together and show you a sample player phase before we move into the enemy phase. So with this, I went ahead and moved the I moved some stuff around so that this is the second round as the first round our players are just kind of getting onto the board and getting ready for the next round. And the reason why I have all my heroes in this particular area and not up here is that if you have two or more models in there, it's going to generate noise. And so I don't want noise being in here as then the these particular enemies would come and investigate during that phase and that would have caused a whole bunch of problems. I want to get in there and start taking care of them. In in their own room and not move them into these this corridor and that and give them an opportunity to attack all right so moving into this then i choose the player that i want to be the active player so i'm going to go ahead and select anya to go and she is going to start with eight action points so she's going to start by opening up this door for her first action point from there then she's going to go ahead and move into the room as her second third and uh, third, let me see here. So one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, and six. So she can target and see him. So I'm going to go ahead and go there. So that was one to open the door, two and three. So she's got five action points left to fire her gun requires her to spend two action points. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. And I do have the necessary bullets that I need and I have range and line of sight to the target. So I'm going to go after the space marine here as he is a nasty customer. And if I can start chipping away at him, that is always a good thing. So I'll go ahead and place his card over here so I can reference it. And from there, then I'm going to gather up my dice. So I got two dice for my accuracy and my Stugavair gives me one die as well. And I don't have anything else that I want to trigger at this point. So I'm going to go ahead and give this a roll. And I got two shields. So I'm going to take two points of his armor. He has four armor. So I'm going to go ahead and give him two on that. So not a bad start. And then I do have this golden nuggets. The hero gains one GP, discard this card after use. So that might be good as I do have some nice abilities there. So I have, that was five action points. I have three left. So I'm gonna go ahead and spend two to trigger that. That'll give me a point, glory point. And I have one action remaining. So I'm gonna go ahead and move her here as my last action. I don't think I have anything else at this point to do. So then it'll move over to my next character to go. So that is going to be Claws. He has six action points to start with and he does have this star card I think I'm gonna use right away. So this card only when adjacent to another hero, the hero using this card gains two glory points. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that as I'm adjacent to other heroes at this point. So I'm gonna cash that in and that didn't cost me anything. So I have six action points remaining. So I'm gonna go ahead and move one, two, three, four, five, and six to put myself adjacent to that guy there. Unfortunately, at this point, I don't have any additional action points unless I want to fatigue myself. There's a lot of enemies in here, so that might be a good option. So I'm going to go ahead and do that and take a fatigue. That gives me three more action points. And I'm going to go ahead and use those to attack. So I'm going to go ahead and attack that drone right there. My gun gives me one. And I get two more for my accuracy on this. So I got three points. And I also have War Veteran, so when Claws makes an attack, you may reroll a single reload, uh, reload result. So if I get any reloads, I can reroll one of them. And that was a terrible roll. So unfortunately, he didn't do anything there. And he took the fatigue for nothing. That's not very good. All right, so that is his turn. So moving over to our next character to go, it is going to be Blaskowitz here. So he's going to move one, two, three, four. Well, I have to go there. Could I see him? I got one there and one there. So I think I do have line of sight to him through the doorway there. So I'm going to go ahead and take a shot with my gun here. So this gives me three dice and my accuracy is going to give me two. 
and I'm gonna go ahead and take a shot and see. So when I take the shot with that, I'm gonna place a noise token here, and then there's already also one in this room. All right, so much better. I got four armor on that drone. The drone uh, there is 38. It only has two armor and one health, so that'll eliminate him. And so I'm gonna remove him. As part of that, I do also raise that hazard tracker by one. So it should have been at zero, so now it's at one, as this is the first time I've done anything. And then I'm also going to gain rewards. I'm gonna get a glory point for that and an ammo of my choice. So I'll just go ahead and take another special. This, his card is going to be discarded then. I can return these. And that will finish off his turn. So then we're over to our last character to go. He has eight action points and his thing has a range of two as well, so I gotta get, I gotta try to get in there close. One, two, three, four, five, six. All right, go here for six. It's not going to give me enough to target anything. So, so let's go seven, eight, and then I will also take a fatigue. This is probably overdoing it here, but uh, trying to get some stuff done here. So then I'm gonna go one, two, I was back there, three. So I'm gonna go there and then I will take my shot. I get two and one. And I'm gonna go ahead and try the Space Marine again. I do have line of sight to target him. So let's see if I can get any more on him. Okay, so I do get a reload token, unfortunately, but I did get a health and one more armor. So I will take that reload as there's not much else I can do about that, but it does add one more armor onto him. So he's only got one armor left and one health left. So he is almost dead. I'll probably get him next time for sure. Okay, so that will finish off the hero's round and we're ready to move into the enemy phase. Once all the players have activated their characters, we're ready to move into the second phase in the round, which is the Nazi phase. During this phase, some of the enemy models will activate based on certain guidelines. Most of the time, enemy models are only going to activate if they're in the, a room or corridor that has a noise token, or an adjacent room or corridor to a noise token, or if they have line of sight to one of the heroes. The one exception to this is with bosses and officers. They are only going to activate if they have line of sight to a hero or if they've already been attacked. They will not chase a noise token into a room that they have not been activated in. A couple other important notes with this. In certain rounds, you might not activate any enemy models if their conditions aren't met, and you're only going to check these conditions at the beginning of a round. So if for whatever reason, halfway through a round, you place a new noise token that would activate another room or whatnot, you are not going to trigger that effect. You're only going to check this at the beginning of the Nazi phase. And then the once you've determined which enemies are going to activate, you'll do that based on the initiative order of each of the enemies. And then once an enemy activates, you're going to follow a specific set of guidelines to activate that enemy. Enemies are also going to have action points, and so they're going to spend those to make an attack action that they can do once per round. They will move and potentially open doors, depending upon if they need to get to heroes or investigate a room that has a noise marker that they don't have line of sight to. Before moving back to the previous example, I wanna go over how enemies are going to activate, as enemies are always going to try to attack first. If they're unable to attack, they're going to move until they are at their maximum range, and then if they have action points left, then they're going to attack. After they resolve their attack, they're going to go ahead and use any remaining action points to move as close as they possibly can to their target. So going over this real quick, we have a Soldat here. His maximum range of his weapon is four spaces. So he is one, two, three, four, five, six spaces away. So he's first going to have to spend two points to move forward out of the six that he has. And then he is now at his maximum weapon range, even though his weapon has a penalty to it at, a, at maximum range, he's gonna go ahead and attack Blaskowitz. After he resolves the attack, he has two action points left. So he'd move two spaces forward. Next, with the Space Marine, it has a maximum range of seven, but he does not have line of sight right now, so he's gonna have to open this door first as his first action point, and then move in as his second. 
From there, then he's going to immediately attack Blaskowitz with his attack action. And that is going to require three action points. So then he would only have one left. So then he would move one space towards Blaskowitz. So going back into our previous example, we have two different enemies in here that are going to activate as they are in a room with a noise token. This corridor does not have any enemies, otherwise this would activate, and neither one of these, this corridor or room, have any enemies, as well as this corridor doesn't have any enemies. So any of these other ones will not activate as they are not going to be triggered, as there are, is no noise tokens adjacent to them. If this corridor had noise token, then these enemies would activate and investigate it. So now that we've determined which enemies are going to activate, each enemy is going to activate based on its initiative. So the drone is super fast, and so that one is going to activate first. So with the drone, it has a laser beam, and it's going to target the hero that is closest to it. So we have two different options for us. So then the players get to choose who is going to be hit. So I'm going to go ahead and have Anya take it. So with this one, it has a range of six, so it, he has range to it, and he is going to inflict two damage to the target hero. This is going to cost two action points. There are no dice rolls with this particular ability, so our hero is simply going to take two damage for that. And so I'll just place, she, she has two armor, so the armor have been eliminated. And then next, he has an ability, so he has a quick counter attack. So after the drone's first attack, each round you're going to roll a die. On a success, the drone attacks a second time. So again, a success is going to be a armor or a health. A miss would be the reload or a blank. So unfortunately, he was successful, so he's going to do two more damage to her. So she's only got one hit point left. And then he is also, at this point, going to spend the remaining portion of his actions to move as close as he can to her. So he'd only move up one more space. And that will be the end of his turn. Then we'll move on to the next enemy. So with the Space Marine, he is going to go ahead and target our character here. He has the AR or the AR Marksman, and this is a, or has plasma mode. It has a range of seven. It's going to roll four dice. So he is nasty. And this is going to cost three action points out of his six. The first HP or armor hit against a hero destroys all of its armor if it has any. With our hero here, he does have two armor, so if we get any hits here, it's going to bypass both points of that armor. Okay, so a reload basically counts as a blank for this, and so the rest of this is going to go through. So it's going to do two armor hits, so he is going to, his first attack will penetrate both of those points of armor, and the second point of that will go to his health, so he takes one damage from that. All right, so at that point, then both of our enemies have activated, and so that will be the end of the enemy round. The final phase in each round is the cleanup phase. Normally this phase is very quick unless a mission has a special rule or something that you'll handle in this phase. So the first step in this phase is if you have any enemy models that have been left on the board that have been defeated, you would remove those at this point. Now normally I just remove them during earlier stages when I defeat them, but if you choose to leave them on, this is the point where you'll remove those. You'll also check all of your rooms and make sure that they need to have noise tokens in them anymore. So for example, this room doesn't have anybody in there, so this noise token will be removed. And as well as this room, as we do not have uh, multiple models in there anymore at this point either. This one will stay as we have plenty of models in there, so that will also stay. From there, once you have completed that, you'll advance the round marker 1. And you'll also choose whichever player you want to be the starting player for the next round. At that point, once you've made that selection, you're ready to move into the next round, starting with the player phase. Now that I've gone over the three phases in a round, there's a couple of other important rules we need to go over. The first is bleeding out and death. So when a hero receives a number of hit points equal to or greater than their health, they are going to start bleeding out. You'll place their model on its side, and then until the next time it activates, the other heroes must get over and try to heal it. If another hero is in an adjacent space to your hero and has the shared health token, it can spend that to bring your hero back up to full health and shields, removing all of that damage. The important note with this is that you cannot heal yourself. So even if you have a shared health token, you cannot use that on yourself to heal you. Another player must be adjacent to you and spend that token. On top of spending that token, the other player will also become fatigued. 
If that player is already fatigued, then they will not gain another fatigue token. The other thing I want to cover are a couple of tokens. The first one is the stun token. So if a hero or enemy has a stun token on it, it is not allowed to perform any actions during its next activation. The other token is the sabotage token. So if a hero or enemy has the sabotage token on it, it is not allowed to perform an attack action during its next activation. Either way, at the end of the activation, these tokens will be removed from that model. So at this point, you're going to continue playing round after round until you've either met the conditions to win the mission or have failed. There's a couple ways you're normally going to fail. If a mission has a specific number of rounds, if you exceed that number, then you automatically fail the mission. Or if all of your heroes have been eliminated, you also fail that mission. Now, some missions might also provide you with some additional things that'll cause you to fail. Otherwise, as long as you've met all of the objectives in the time that you need to, you have won the mission and succeeded at saving the world hopefully and the other thing i do want to point out there is a sequence to follow when you are completing or triggering different things based on the enemies cards and hero cards and then the main rules so you're always going to look at the enemy card first and this is going to be a, a great example of this is with the super soldier soldat they have a ability that has great armor so as long as the the super soldat has armor all damage dealt to it must target armor first. So that rule is going to supersede other rules that bypass armor. And then with that being the different heroes or weapon cards, and then if there was anything else in the rule book, that would come last. So just one other thing to point out with that. So again, from here, then you would continue playing until you have met those conditions. So I hope you found this video helpful. If you have any questions or comments, please post those in the comment section below and I'll do my best to answer them. Also, let me know when you're down there if there's anything else you want to see around this. I have an unboxing and a playthrough already, which I'll have a link to in the description as well as at the end of this video. And let me know if you want to see anything else. I am looking at doing at least one more playthrough covering how the three train works with this. I want to show that off as that is a really neat thing. And I might play through one more mission a little bit later in the campaign to show you some of the differences between that and the first mission. But let me know in the comments down below if there's anything else you want to see around this. I love starting a conversation. And thank you so much for taking the time to watch the video and let me feedback on that. I do really appreciate it. Giving a thumb up or a comment is huge help. And if you really want to help out also consider sharing and subscribing those are huge ways that you can help the channel as well so until next time i'll see you later